brand new Nicktoon, Invader Zim. The show stars Zim in the role of Zim, an alien bent on taking over the Earth. To do so, he disguises himself as Zim, an Earthling grade school student. Invader Zim is notorious in the lore of 2000s cartoons. By some, it's simply remembered as the LOL XD random show plastered all over Hot Topic when we were in middle school, and by others, it's more generously remembered for what it actually was. For me personally, it reminds me of being a tween, wishing my parents would let me dress like a scene kid, and having a good laugh with my friends or my dad. I have really fond memories of the show, and I'm very excited to dive into it today with you. In the later half of the 90s, Nickelodeon was looking for a series to suit its young teen demographic for ages 11 to 15. A producer was searching for a concept with a similar edge to Ren and Stimpy when she happened upon Joan and Vasquez's darkly funny and visually stylish comics and reached out to him to ask if he would like to pitch an animated series. He had no experience in animation at the time, but he accepted the offer and created a pilot, resulting in the series being greenlit and premiering its first episode on television in 2001. Invader Zim was basically the antithesis of every other Nicktoon at the time. It's deranged, disturbing, menacing, and hilarious. This has got to be one of the most watchable cartoons from that era, and I honestly find it even funnier now as an adult than I did when I was a kid. Invader Zim's view of human society is absolutely nihilistic, with no respect for the average human, and I love it. So, Zim is basically the worst invader ever of all of the Urgans and is infamous on his home planet. He's so bad at his job that his bosses, the Almighty Tallest, banished him to Food Cordia. But he's so bad shit that he quits his banishment and they send him to a planet that they don't know exists in an attempt to get rid of him. However, to their surprise, he arrives safely on a planet called Earth and begins to plan for the Urgan invasion that he believes is coming. It is not coming. What follows is a series of adventures starring Zim, his robot assistant Gurr, his archenemy Dib, and occasionally Dib's sister Gaz. Most of the adventures are related to Dib trying to expose Zim as an alien. However, since most of humanity is extremely gullible and ignorant, usually everyone thinks Dib is crazy. The invasion will continue. More Zim on the way. We warned ya. He's short. He's green. He's back. Invader Zim. I don't know why, but I find Zim weirdly adorable. Maybe it's the silliness of the things he believes wholeheartedly, his inability to do things correctly, or his desire to please the tallest and get their approval, or his overdramatic personality and uniquely strange voice, but he's always been bizarrely endearing to me. That one looks good. Oh, why did it hurt? Zim's human disguise is well designed, but also hilarious. It's like Danny Phantom level of basically not even being a disguise. All he does is put on contacts and a wig. What about his horrible green head? Insolent fool boy! It's a skin condition. He's still got his pack backpack on all the time, which is literally required for him to live. He'll die within 10 minutes if he loses it. Packs provide life support and necessary nutrients for survival for Urkins, alongside a variety of weapons and tools, including spider-like mechanical legs, which you will see in Nick All-Star Brawl if you've been playing that lately. Something that surprised me when I rewatched the series for this video is that Zim is at least 50 years old and probably a lot older. When Tak, a fellow Urkin, comes to Earth, she reveals that he blocked her from becoming an invader 50 to 70 years ago when he accidentally shut down the power block for her half of Urk. Tak has a cool Sir unit named Mimi who can turn into a cat. Those two are probably my favorite design of anyone in the series. According to Jonan Vasquez, Zim is older than any living human, which makes him a young adult by Urkin standards. Despite being apparently the worst Urkin invader of all time, Zim is very confident in his own abilities. The tallest were wise to choose me. This planet won't know what hit it after I've learned its weakness. Computer! Play back any recordings of me discussing Phase 2. Would you like me to record any and all mention of Phase 2? No thank you! Zim forgets nothing! Hmm, besides reminding me how cool I look and sound, that was of no help. Which honestly might be warranted because Zim is still pretty capable of committing atrocities, but he's overconfident and self-congratulatory to the point where he usually doesn't realize his failures. And he has a tendency to cause needless destruction, posing a danger to himself and every living being around him. 
He does something sadistic and horrifying in so many episodes, whether it's ripping out his only friend's eyes and replacing them with ones that see all squirrels as Zim's image, taking control of Dib's arms by implanting a device in his stomach, literally harvesting organs, that one got banned, or introducing baloney DNA into Dib's body or sending his entire class into a wormhole headed for a room with a moose. Truly the most terrifying of them all. But he has his moments of silliness too, because his attempts at planetary domination pretty much always fail, and he ends up looking like a dumbass. Like the time he was stomping around in a giant invisible doom machine and had no idea that Dib could see him in it the entire time. Zim is not that great at being incognito, but it kind of balances out because the show depicts humanity as way too intellectually destitute to notice the alien in their midst. Are you an alien? Lies! They filled the earth by lies! I mean, no. Don't they have rain on your planet? Of course! We owe oh, such rain we had. It, it was delicious. There are a lot of hilarious aspects of Zim, whether it's the subtle ways in which he misunderstands and misinterprets the norms of humanity, or the simple comedy of the way he speaks. Richard Horvitz did an incredible job voicing the character, and lines like this are enough to make me laugh so hard I need to pause to give myself a chance to breathe. <laughs> Inferior human organs! Oh, my squealy spooch! Zim does have more layers than what I had originally thought, though. He's skilled in urban science and creates a lot of gadgets throughout the series. And he can fix Gur pretty quickly, too. This leads me to believe that he is intelligent in a technical sense, it's just that he doesn't think like any other character does, so their logic makes no sense to him, and it doesn't apply to him. And I'm not saying that's a good thing. Zim had plenty of opportunities to take over the planet, and he squandered them by hyper-focusing on his rivalry with Dib or being paranoid. It seems like Zim doesn't really care about enslaving Earthlings or any of that jazz, he just does what he does in order to seek approval from the almighty tallest, his bosses. When you really take a look at him, underneath the intermingled confidence and insanity, he's pretty insecure about his abilities as an invader. All the invaders are farther along in their conquest than I am! Computer, show me invader scotch! But I don't even blame him for feeling like this. I mean, the entire Urken race laughs at him when he calls in, and nobody from his home planet ever takes him seriously. His bosses sent him as far away as they could possibly fathom in order to never see him again, and they even tried to kill him by sending him into the sun in another instance. We'd love to grant your request, but uh, we think you're insane. Untrained. Untrained? Invader Zim? He knows we can still see and hear him, right? I liked when he was dead! They constantly laugh at his failure, and send him off with a robot built to be dysfunctional. You're watching Offbeat Kiki. Invader Zim, only on Nicktoons Network. Not just cartoons, Nicktoons. Gur is Zim's enigma of a robot assistant. He wears a green dog suit when in disguise, and is obsessed with tacos. He is often seen doing anything except for the assignments given to him by Zim, especially if he can eat food instead, which makes a lot of sense because he isn't built to be functional. The Almighty Tallest custom made him this way for Zim because they hate him. Is it supposed to be stupid? It's not stupid. It's advanced. Gur was hilarious when I was 10, I found him annoying when I was a teenager, and now as an adult I find him hilarious again just because he's so ridiculously over the top and seemingly purposefully ineffectual. I say that because Gur clearly has many capabilities. Which way is the school? And on multiple occasions, he does things that require a high degree of artificial intelligence, functionality, and autonomy. In the episode Gur Goes Crazy and Stuff, Gur gets locked in duty mode and realizes that Zim's irrationality poses a threat to their mission. And on another occasion, he takes control of the base's computer and pilots the entire house to the local taco place. Which, by the way, has a drink that's just called poop. <laughs> He has advanced guidance skills and has a number of weapons inside of his head. It seems Zim has modded him multiple times since receiving him and going to Earth. However, he still often messes up Zim's plans and otherwise causes issues for Zim by disobeying or disregarding orders. Gur doesn't do this because he dislikes Zim or anything, he just seems to be the robot embodiment of ADHD. 
Gurr kind of behaves like Zim's friend or little brother, and they usually get along fine. He's really a good fit for Zim, considering how off-kilter that little alien dude is. You're ugly when you lie, Dib! I'm not lying! Then why are you ugly? Zim hates Dib because he and Gaz are the only people on Earth who know his true identity as an Urken invader. And while Gaz doesn't really give a shit because she knows Zim is too goofy to conquer the Earth, Dib makes it his mission to expose Zim and his plans. However, throughout the series, they kind of seem like frenemies, in the sense that they know each other's minds better than anyone else, and they do end up teaming up in several scenarios. They are also similar in stature, outcasts on their respective home planets, and more intelligent than their peers at school. They seem to respect each other as adversaries, as in A Room with a Moose, Zim states that his mission of earthly domination would be less exciting without Dib around to annoy him. Dib's character is kind of tragic because he's the only person on Earth who recognizes that Zim is an alien bent on the destruction of the planet. He's been obsessed with aliens and the paranormal since he was a kid, and he loves to watch this series called Mysterious Mysteries. He's actually sent them so many tapes that they have a full closet of Dib archives, and the host of the show has a scar on his face from the last time. We never find out what the last time was, but I think it's hilarious that Dib and Zim are enemies and have both wreaked havoc on other people's lives on their home planets. That show Mysterious Mysteries eventually does an episode on Dib's obsession with exposing Zim, in which we get confirmation that his entire class thinks he's bonkers. Yeah, he's pretty crazy. He told me my daddy was a yeti. Their teacher does too. Miss Bitters is horrifying, always slithering around like a snake and speaking in an incredibly morbid fashion, but she occasionally says something that I find hilarious. I'm Lady Horrible Nightmare Visions! It's called Life, Dib. Sit down. I think her humor was for the adults watching the show. It's kind of sad, because Dib is right about Zim and basically every other bad thing happening to their town, and he even saves his entire class from the room with the moose, and nobody knows or cares. Am I the only one here who sees the aliens sitting in class? In the episode Dib's Wonderful Life of Doom, we get a glimpse of a future where Dib works as a serious scientist. Considering we saw Dib go through so many horrifying experiences at Zim's behest, it was nice to see him successful in one potential timeline. I am proud to open the Dib Institute of Paranormal Studies slash School of Paranormal Tolerance. In Enter the Florpus, which we're going to talk about more in depth in a bit, Dib has a signed poster of his father on the wall that says, Thanks for being a fan, Membrane. Dib is the son of the smartest person alive, but his father is very detached from him and his sister because of how busy he is, and he doesn't believe in any of Dib's alien, Bigfoot, etc. interests because he is a man of science. You gotta sign this for the sake of all mankind! No, no, I don't sign autographs backstage, little boy. How does my schedule look for the rest of this year? Busy, sir, very busy. Wait, something just opened up for September. Oh, scratch that, it just filled up. Where are you going at this hour? Oh, you know. To save the Earth? Yes. My poor insane son. Dib's family really doesn't listen to him. There's a moment in the first episode where he's trying to show his dad an Urken transmission, but his dad ignores him because he's busy making toast. Dib's sister Gaz bears witness to several of Dib's encounters with Zim in his alien form, but she just doesn't give a shit. She's too busy doing her own thing, which usually means kicking ass at video games. This actually came in handy when Zim took over Dib's arms by sending a device into his stomach through his food, because Gaz stepped in and controlled him like a video game. Gaz typically acts on her own interests, saving Dib because it serves her, whether it's because she gets to play video games or because he has to come along so they can go to Bloaty's Pizza Hog for dinner with their father. Gaz really likes pizza. Oh yeah! Thanks, Gaz! Don't want to starve to death while saving the Earth! <laughs> Let it be known that from this day until the end of the day, vengeance will be mine. Dib, you will not know the meaning of peace, for I shall rain misery down upon your pizza-stealing heart! One of Gaz's best moments is when she intimidates an obnoxious, sexist gamer boy. She's in line for the new game system and is supposed to get the last one, but the kid steals it from her and then proceeds to brag about how she'll never be a better gamer than him. 
She emotionally terrorizes the bratty little boy until he gives her the game system. And it's one of my favorite moments of the entire series. He's literally the most irritating child and I would also kick his ass if I were Gaz. I think it's awesome that the most badass character in the main cast is just a little girl with purple hair. I love her. I'm only 13 levels away from finishing this game, so I either finish my game or make you wish I was never born. Hey there, thanks so much for watching so far. I hope you're enjoying yourself. If you want to see more of me, go ahead and follow me on Twitter, Tumblr, and Instagram. And if you're interested in getting a behind the scenes look at what I'm working on for this channel, please check out my Patreon. Tiers are as low as $1 and I post weekly updates and exclusive content. Back to the show. So in the 1999 pitch pilot, Zim is at school and Dib tries to prove he's an alien by convincing him to eat beans which sends him into some kind of horrible allergic reaction. Zim and Dib have a super cool fight, which happens in the school, but is visualized in some type of cyberspace realm, and they absolutely trash the cafeteria, and Dib gets in a world of trouble and has to write, Zim is not an alien, on the chalkboard a bunch of times. Zim's voice is different, Gur's voice is different, there's still the shot of the monkey image above the couch, and he still gets to his lab via the toilet. It's interesting comparing this to the first true episode of the series from 2001. They sort of reappropriated the Zim voice that was happening in the original pilot for Gurr, and Richard Horvitz stepped in to voice Zim. And the plot starts from when Zim is assigned to Earth, instead of just beginning at school. Overall, I think the artistic decisions they made were definitely for the better, but I also think it's super dope that the pitch pilot is widely available for fans of the show to check out. Meanwhile, the series pilot establishes the mood and characters perfectly, has an incredibly menacing soundtrack, and all things considered is an amazing pilot episode. This show has meticulously strange sound design for even the smallest details like the deafening silence of a classroom or footsteps. <laughs> Yo. But I'll smell like the toilet. Exactly. But Willie was the last one to use it. The music can get pretty unhinged as well. It's one of my favorite elements of the experience. Composer Kevin Manthe did an excellent job matching the uncanny, strange, nihilistic, and deranged mood of the series. <laughs> Title sequences get me as excited as this one does. The music in the intro is intense and carries a lot of urgency. It's so beautiful and scary and perfectly establishes the mood for whatever horrifying and hilarious story is up next. And the best part is it usually ends with Zim daydreaming of laughing evilly while instead doing something much more benign, like walking Gurr or getting hit by a dodgeball. Ah, my spine! The sense of humor in this series is purposefully very disturbing, but I enjoy it for the most part. I'm not big on gross out humor, so episodes like Rise of the Zit Boy aren't a highlight for me, but I do enjoy the more frivolous gags and the way they trivialize Zim and Dib's emotions to take the piss out of them. Like this scene where Zim has anxiety over having no friends, and two girls literally do a cat's cradle that says friends in it. We also can't forget the random edgy 2000s humor, but to naysayers of this, I say cringe is dead and this shit is funny again. I love absurdism and this show definitely does too. Why was there bacon in the soap? I made it myself! Oh, what is that? A warning! Oh no! Oh no! FBI? Who is this FBI? What are they trying to warn us about? I love seeing Zim struggle to process life on Earth and fit in, and the way that the show's philosophy is informed by an absolute lack of faith in humanity. I think that aspect of the series is very forward-thinking and would be relatable and entertaining for today's teenagers as well who have grown up witnessing the worst of what the world can do. Hello, friends. I am a perfectly normal human worm baby. I have a mighty need to use the restroom once again. Okay, but that's your last restroom break for the rest of the school year. 
add a card to represent the overworked educational system. So you can see, children, that our whole society is nothing more than a perilous house of cards. As you know, the desk budget for this year has run out. Every bar you sell earns money for your school. But what's in it for you? Prizes, prizes, prizes! Sell 100 bars and you win a... Adhesive medical strips. Warning, candy made entirely of sawdust. Sorry, kid. Since they got the funding, we're not even allowed to look at those monitors. In the episode Walk of Doom, going for a walk is depicted as the most horrifying experience. Zim can't ride the bus, he goes blind from looking at the sun, he busks with Gurr for bus money, the bus gets stuck in endless traffic and has horrifying babies, crying ladies, and clowns on it. Zim gets incredibly overstimulated on the bus and envies taxi riders. He does not get home. He gets dropped off at a butcher shop. What is wrong with these people? This place is just begging to be destroyed! And even though on the surface this might just seem like a funny premise, I honestly think it would be relatable for a lot of people after experiencing pandemic life, because being in public is exponentially more disgusting and scary and overwhelming these days than a few years ago. Maybe just because we notice it more, because we became infinitely more aware of the biological danger of interacting with strangers, but Invader Zim knew that years ago. There are a number of episodes that just present a horrifying premise and don't go much deeper than that. Like Hamstergeddon, in which Zim makes the classroom hamster Godzilla-sized and then has to take it down when things go awry. Or the episode Plague of Babies, where an alien race that looks like human babies comes after Zim to steal his ship and morphs into a mega baby. And that's one of the things I think really helps the horror land in this series, is that the episodes are not bound to the typical plot structure of problem and resolution. Many episodes end without any degree of resolution at all, and leave you surprised and shocked at where the story stops. Like the episode Germs, where Zim spends the entire episode in germ detection goggles and realizes the McAmedes burger meat is germ resistant. He shows up at school covered in meat, which is clearly not a feasible and incognito solution. So you'd think something more would happen, or maybe at least we would see Dib react. But instead, Zim just smiles and it cuts to black. I feel like this is one of the reasons Invader Zim is still watchable for adults. It's very unpredictable. All of these reflections on the writing, its uniqueness, and modernity are the main reasons I called this video, There Will Never Be Another Invader Zim. You're watching Offbeat Kiki. I kept an eye out for things that didn't age well, and while most of the show was like a fine wine, I caught one singular joke that seems to be at the expense of trans people. I pretty much expect this of Nick shows from the early 2000s, but that doesn't make them any less unpleasant. Dip is talking to rat people in a parking garage, and one of the rat people says she was once a man, and the parking garage turned her into a woman. Now, if living in a parking garage makes you realize you're trans, that's chill. We should probably have all the eggs of the world hang out there a bit more often. But she's literally presented as a hideous, ghoulish monster. Not cool. You can skip to pretty much any moment that happens in Zim's house or outside, and the art looks stunning in its own peculiar way. I love the way jewel tones are used to create a dark and moody environment throughout. The art is a treat in this show. Its color palette is right up my alley. Sometimes it's hard for CGI to blend well in cartoons, but I think it worked out really well in this series, even in the pilot. They mostly use it for elements like flying Urken ships or Zim's house building itself, so it successfully lends to the fact that all of the tech in those scenes is alien and otherworldly. I also really enjoy the character design. Zim is the perfect blend of deranged monster and harmless short little Urkin, and Dip was well put together as his nemesis. Dip's design was actually altered a bit during the first season in a series of changes called God Save the Dib, proposed by Jonah Vasquez, and you can really see the difference that a bunch of small changes make to suit the way he was written. Even the art in the series enforces the faithlessness and humanity, constantly depicting public places and regular human residences as pits of filth. So overall, other than the unnecessary jab at transness, the series has aged well, the writing was solid, and it still holds up visually. 
My favorite episodes of the series mostly involve the writers taking the ridiculousness to the extreme. There's Parent Teacher Night, in which Zim tries to use his robot parents for a school event and things go horribly awry. There's Invasion of the Idiot Dog Brain, where Gurr takes control of the base's computer for over a year and then takes the house to the taco place, which turns into a police chase. Or there's Room with a Moose. But all of these were some of my favorites when I was younger, so I guess not much has changed there. One that stood out to me this time around was Abducted, the episode where Zim is mistaken for human and abducted by a different alien race. The aliens are hilariously ineffectual, and every specimen they've ever captured has escaped. It's just especially silly and ridiculous. My least favorite episode, I'm sorry to say, is Hobo 13. It does show how selfish Zim can be, but honestly, I just didn't care about it that much because of how far removed it is from the regular environment and plot of Invader Zim. It's not really a serialized show, so it's hard to determine if anything is necessarily a filler episode, but to me this kind of felt like one. And the most disgusting episode, although there are a few contenders, is probably Lice, in my opinion. If you've ever had the misfortune of having that problem, you'll understand why instantly. Invader Zim has often been cited as one of Nickelodeon's best shows and earned multiple nominations and awards, such as an Annie, Emmy, and World Animation Celebration Award. The series is widely regarded as a cult classic and has a fan base to this day, and as a result, merch is relatively easy to find, even 15 years after the conclusion of the original series. Since 2011, there have been several fan-run InvaderCon conventions run by Wasabi Anime. The original convention celebrated the 10th anniversary of the series and was held in Atlanta, Georgia. Since 2015, a comic series has been running monthly, published by Oni Press. That comic, alongside the original series, informed Enter the Florpus, a 2019 70-minute film continuation of the series written by creator Jonan Vasquez. It seems that Nickelodeon wanted to do a new Zim series, but there were debates over the budget, and so it was negotiated to a miniseries, then to a film for television. The movie was originally planned to be shown on Nickelodeon, but its distribution rights were sold to Netflix. If you like Invader Zim, you have to watch Enter the Florbus. It's a really fun romp in which Zim resurfaces after a long time in hiding and actually gets close to earthly domination. I don't want to recount the entire plot, but I am going to talk about the story fairly in depth as it relates to the topics we've discussed so far, so skip ahead to the next chapter if you want to avoid spoilers. Invader Zim will be back when he's good and ready. The art of this movie was incredible. I love the opening sequence to bits, and I think the redesigns they did for the characters modernize them a little bit while retaining the attitude of the original. The colors are less dark and dim, and the shapes are a bit blockier and rounder. If they were going to change the art style at all, this seems like the way to do it. Every time I watch this movie, I find myself just staring with hard eyes at the art and how clean and snappy it is. And of course, it's also just an absolute delight as a lifetime fan of the series to see it animated in HD. It doesn't seem necessary for there to be any more of the series after this, but if they ever do revive it as a series, I hope they follow this art direction because it would successfully separate itself from the original series without being too strong of a stylistic departure. The writing was still hilarious and ridiculous, probably because Vasquez wrote it, so there was no imitation needed. Some of my favorite segments are the anime opening, I used to look up at space with hope and wonder in my eyes until space looked back. The scene where Zim commits all these petty crimes to fuck with Dib. I'm reading someone's newspaper. I don't pay for a subscription. <laughs> the fucking hilarious scene where Zim calls the tallest. Zim, we thought you were dead. Could a dead Zim do this? Isn't the time for the giant pizza story, Gurr? And that will never happen! Computer, did you put the tallest on hold? Nope. Uh, I'm realizing now that if I keep listing them all off, I'll end up showing you the entire movie. The film was very well received, and I personally enjoyed it quite a lot, and I felt it made some nice small changes while maintaining the spirit of the series. Everything was pretty much on point, and I'm super glad that fans of the series get to see a worthy revival. But by far, the most important element of Enter the Florpus was the way it transformed the relationship of the Membrane family and the depth of its characters. If you've watched my videos before, you know how much I love character and relationship analysis. And the original show didn't go too deep in that direction. 
but Enter the Florbus really dove into how Dib felt about his dad being a famous scientist, always busy and never taking him seriously. And it also built out Gaz as a more sympathetic character, and just really expanded the dynamic of the Membrane family. Even Zim shows more emotions when he realizes how far away the tallest are, he drenches himself in a depressed pile of nacho cheese and lets Dib capture him as he sobs on the floor. The tallest aren't coming! So you really give up? I've lost the respect of my tallest! Dib even opens up to Zim about how his dad doesn't believe in him either. And although Zim uses this moment to his advantage, he does admit later in the movie that he really was very sad about the tallest. But Dib gave him the idea for his takeover plan that got him out of that slump. The writing for this movie was excellent outside of the more serious stuff as well. Honestly, they really nailed every aspect of the artistic direction. Near the end where the earth is about to fall into the Florpus hole, the characters are shown panicking in a bunch of different art styles, and it's such a labor of love for animation that I cry every time I get to that point in the film. It's seriously fucking beautiful, I adore that sequence with my entire being. While it was much less in focus, the philosophy of faithlessness and humanity that I mentioned earlier is still around too. Look at them, girl! All this time trying to subjugate the humans and all I had to do was charge them for it! Professor Membrane gets kidnapped and sent to a prison planet called Mu Ping Ten, and Dib and Gaz have to go rescue him. It's awesome to see them working together, and to see Gaz generally being a little nicer to Dib, as if she's grown up a bit in the face of danger. They softened her whole character out a bit, actually. Also, apparently her full name is Gaz Lean? That one caught me off guard. Anyway, once they get to their dad and rescue him from the planet, they find out he still doesn't believe in aliens and thinks that everything going on is a hallucination. Well, that was very convincing. Because it's real, Dad! How could anything that horrifying be real? We also find out that Professor Membrane has laser arms, which isn't actually surprising considering he's a world famous scientist and is always wearing gloves over that white coat. But regardless, it was still pretty sick seeing him send an energy blast at all those robots. I definitely think the underlying intention of this film was to redeem the Membrane family, and they totally did it. You'll be proud of me! Son, you don't have to prove anything. I'm always proud of you. I honestly don't really have any criticisms of this film. I recognize the effort, love, and care put into it, and I am so grateful as a longtime fan of the series that we got to see more of Dib trying to save the world from Zim's insanity. And even if you haven't seen it yet and you listen to this part of the video, I definitely think you should give it a watch. It's only 71 minutes long and it's available on Netflix. Is everything over? Yes, girl. Did we win? Of course, Sim always wins. A number of episodes were partially produced before they were abandoned. There are transcripts available for some of these episodes and others have been explained in concept at conventions. According to the unmade episode The Trial, Zim is considered an Urken defective, meaning he was fitted with a faulty pack and cannot be brainwashed by the Urken Imperial control, making him unpredictable and dangerous. There are 16 of these that I could find that are full of character clues and expanded lore, and I would love to do a deep dive into the available resources for these episodes in another video. Please let me know if that's something you would be interested in. One might argue that Invader Zim is one of the most groundbreaking and influential cartoons to come out of the 2000s. The shockwaves of its humor and boundary-pushing plots can be seen in modern animated series like Adventure Time, Regular Show, and maybe even Rick and Morty. Invader Zim was fucking weird, and it took so much twisted joy in it. It made fun of everything it discussed, with its worldview that seemed fucked up all those years ago, but feels much more real than I would have expected it to at 26 years old. And even after all this time, it's still fun as hell to throw on, and great for busting a gut with your buddies. I love this show. Typically, my retrospectives take longer than a month, and I end up figuring out something about my life during the journey of production, but I'm not sure that I learned any life lessons while I was making this one. I honestly just feel happy to have watched something that I loved when I was young and have it still hold up and make me laugh. My memories from back then are irreparably tainted by trauma, and it's awesome to be able to pull this series out of my memory and make it a part of my life now at 26 where I'm in a safe place, supporting myself, and have the ability to enjoy what I love without judgment. Actually, now I get to share the things I love with you here on my channel, and instead of just yelling into the void, the internet talks back to me. 
This channel recently reached 10,000 subscribers, and I couldn't be more grateful to have so many people signed up to hear what I have to say. It's a privilege to have a platform, and I promise to continue using it for good, whether that's by appreciating media you forgot about, or sharing life lessons that I think people need to hear. Thank you for subscribing, and thank you for watching. I am the queen of the universe, the way it's time. <laughs> oh, God.